this video, we're going to cover the hormonal regulation of metabolism. We're going to break down how the hormones insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine regulate metabolic processes in the body, specifically in liver, muscle, and adipose tissue. We're also going to talk about what happens in different metabolic states, after meals, fasted state, and during starvation. So let's subtract complexity by starting with insulin. So after consuming a high carbohydrate meal, blood glucose levels increases, and this causes insulin secretion by the pancreas. The hormones insulin and glucagon are produced by specialized pancreatic cells called the islets of Langerhans. So alpha cells produce glucagon and beta cells produce insulin. So how does this occur? Let's break this down further. When blood glucose levels increase, GLUT2 transporters allow glucose into the pancreatic beta cells where it's phosphorylated by glucokinase or hexokinase 4 and we form glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate enters glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, yielding ATP. Now, when ATP concentration increases, ATP-gated potassium channels in the plasma membrane closes, which depolarizes the membrane. This depolarization opens the voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing calcium into the cell which increases the intracellular calcium concentration. Now, as the calcium concentration increases, this is going to trigger the release of insulin by exocytosis. So insulin will then lower blood glucose levels by taking up glucose in the tissues, and when blood glucose levels decrease, the pancreatic beta cells will detect this, and it's going to inhibit the glucokinase reaction and stopping the release of insulin. This feedback loop is what regulates insulin release. So let's discuss the metabolic effects of insulin. Insulin will stimulate glucose uptake by muscle and fat tissue via the GLUT transporter, GLUT4. There will also be increased glucose uptake by the liver, increasing glucokinase activity, and this will lead to glucose oxidation via glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation to acetyl-CoA. So this will activate phosphorofructokinase 1 or PFK1 and pyruvate dehydrogenase complex activity because pyruvate is being converted to acetyl-CoA. In the liver and muscle, this will stimulate glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis. So glycogen synthase will be activated. And if glycogen synthesis is activated, glycogen breakdown is inhibited. So glycogen phosphorylase, the enzyme involved in glycogen breakdown, will be inhibited. And excess energy and excess acetyl-CoA will serve as the precursor for fatty acid synthesis. So this is going to increase acetyl-CoA carboxylase activity. Now, insulin also triggers triacylglycerol synthesis in adipocyte, increasing lipoprotein lipase activity. So to summarize, insulin triggers glucose uptake and excess glucose is converted to glycogen storage in liver and muscle and triacylglycerols in adipose tissue. Now, let's take a look at this in context of a well-fed state or after a meal. And let's take a look at the pathways of glucose, amino acids, and fats. So after a meal, glucose, amino acids, and fats enter the liver. Insulin is secreted by the pancreas, and this is going to trigger glucose uptake by the tissues. Some of these glucose is transported to the brain and muscle for energy production. In the liver, glucose is oxidized to pyruvate via glycolysis and then oxidized to acetyl-CoA, which can be further oxidized to yield ATP. Now, excess acetyl-CoA can also serve as a precursor for triacylglycerol synthesis and exported to adipose tissue and muscle. And with fatty acid synthesis, if we recall back from the fatty acid synthesis lecture, it requires the electron donor NADPH. And this can be obtained from pentose phosphate pathway or the malic enzyme activity. 
where it converts malate to pyruvate in the cytosol. In muscle, fatty acids are oxidized to yield ATP. And so let's go back to the other source, and that is amino acids. And amino acids are degraded by removing its ammonia group and yielding alpha keto acids, or its carbon skeletons. The ammonia is converted to urea via the urea cycle for excretion, and these amino acids can be diverted to protein synthesis because amino acids can't be stored in the body. Then we have fats, so triacylglycerols that travel through the lymphatic system to the liver, muscle, and adipose tissue. So that's the well-fed state and how insulin regulates glucose uptake after a calorie-rich meal. The next hormone we're going to talk about is glucagon which is secreted when there is low blood glucose. So glucagon, glucose is gone. So glucagon is secreted by the pancreatic alpha cell. This occurs several hours after food intake or in between meals because the brain and tissues are oxidizing glucose for energy. So when glucagon secretion increases, insulin release will decrease. So what are the metabolic effects when glucagon is secreted? Well, the cell's job is to maintain ATP concentration. So when glucose levels decrease, glucagon is going to signal to the cell to increase glucose in multiple ways. First, it's going to trigger glycogen breakdown or glycogenolysis in the liver so that we can yield glucose. Glucagon is going to stimulate glycogen phosphorylase, which is the enzyme that breaks down glycogen to glucose. And so if glucagon triggers glycogen breakdown, it's going to inhibit glycogen synthesis because we don't need to store glucose. So glycogen synthase, which is the enzyme responsible in glycogen synthesis, is going to be inhibited. So refer back to the regulation of glycogen breakdown and synthesis where we covered how these enzymes, glycogen phosphorylase and glycogen synthase, is phosphorylated and dephosphorylated. So removing and attaching phosphate groups to activate and inactivate these enzymes. Now, glucagon is also going to inhibit and slow down glycolysis. And it does this by inhibiting the enzyme phosphorofructokinase 1, or PFK1. On the other hand, it's going to activate glucose synthesis by gluconeogenesis. So the formation of glucose molecules from non-carbohydrate sources, so pyruvate, lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. So glucagon is going to increase the FBPase2 activity, increase PEP carboxykinase, and decrease pyruvate kinase. So pyruvate kinase is the enzyme that is responsible and catalyzing the last step of glycolysis, converting phosphorenol pyruvate to pyruvate. And it does this by triggering its cyclic AMP-dependent phosphorylation. So it can't convert phosphorenol pyruvate to pyruvate. So therefore, we're inhibiting pyruvate oxidation via the citric acid cycle. And if pyruvate kinase activity is slowed down, there's going to be a buildup of PEP, which is going to further activate gluconeogenesis because glucagon is also triggering PEP carboxykinase. So recall that mitochondrial PEP carboxynase is a glucogenic enzyme. So the overall objective of glucagon is to mobilize glycogen and inhibit glucose oxidation in order to replenish blood glucose levels. Not only does glucagon act on hepatocytes, it also stimulates triacylglycerol breakdown in adipose tissue. And the way it does this is it binds to its receptor in the membrane of the fat cell, causing a cascade of reactions that activate protein kinase, which then phosphorylate the hormone-sensitive lipase, HSL, and the paralipin molecules that's on the surface of lipid droplets. And we covered this in the fatty acid mobilization transport and transport lecture. And this is going to release the fatty acids which are then transported to the liver and other extrahepatic tissues for energy production. So glucagon stimulates fatty acid oxidation in adipose tissue and activate hormone-sensitive lipase. Let's do a quick recap on how glucagon causes a cascade of reactions involving G-proteins. So these metabolic effects of glucagon 
involved cyclic AMP-dependent protein phosphorylation. So what happens is when blood glucose levels drop, glucagon is secreted and binds to specific surface receptors, activating a series of reactions involving G proteins. Now remember that glucagon acts only on hepatocytes as muscles lack the receptors for glucagon. And so it's going to stimulate the production of cyclic AMP, which is an intracellular second messenger. The concentration of cyclic AMP is going to increase, and this is going to trigger protein kinase A, because protein kinase A is cyclic AMP dependent. Now, protein kinase A is going to phosphorylate phosphorylase kinase, activating glycogen phosphorylase, and therefore activating glycogen breakdown. Protein kinase A is also going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase. But instead of activating it, it's going to inactivate it. And this is going to inhibit glycogen synthesis. And another thing is protein kinase is also going to inactivate protein kinase by phosphorylating it. And one last thing, it's going to inhibit PFK1 or phosphorofructokinase 1, which is an enzyme that's part of glycolysis. So therefore, it's going to inhibit glycolysis. And we covered this in great detail in the regulation of glycolysis. Okay, so now let's take a look at this in context during a fasting state. So several hours after a meal, and let's take a look at the pathways of glucose, amino acids, and fats. So we have three types of energy stores. Glycogen, which are stored in liver and muscle. Triacylglycerol, stored in adipose tissue. And proteins in our tissue. And a few hours after a meal, we're going to break down glycogen stores. In about four hours post-absorpted state, insulin release will slow down and glucagon release will increase because we have oxidized glucose for the brain and other tissues. So let's map out these pathways during a fasting state. The liver is going to be the primary source of glucose for the brain. So liver glycogen is going to be broken down to glucose 1-phosphate and then be converted to glucose 6-phosphate, and then to free glucose. Free glucose is going to be exported to the bloodstream where it travels to the brain for oxidation. Now, protein and liver and muscle are going to be broken down to amino acids, and we can convert this to pyruvate and ketone bodies. Pyruvate is diverted to gluconeogenesis to regenerate glucose and we call that ketone bodies are produced when glucose levels drop and it becomes the alternate energy source especially for the brain because the fatty acids can't cross the blood brain barrier so our body is also going to respond by breaking down triacylglycerols and mobilize fatty acids for fuel that our muscle and liver needs and excess acetyl-CoA is shunted to ketone bodies production and it's exported to other tissues and we can also use glycerol for gluconeogenesis and produce glucose. So this is what happens during a fasting state. Let's take a look at what happens during prolonged fasting or starvation and also uncontrolled diabetes. So when the body has depleted glycogen stores, gluconeogenesis becomes the main source of fuel for the brain. Protein is broken down to amino acids via transamination, separating the ammonia from the carbon skeletons. The ammonia group is converted to urea and it's excreted in the urine by the kidneys because ammonia is toxic. And the carbon skeletons of glucogenic amino acids are converted to pyruvate or other citric acid cycle intermediates, which then serves as precursors for gluconeogenesis. And this is occurring in the liver so that we can produce Glucose. So the carbon skeletons can enter the citric acid cycle, and oxaloacetate is used in gluconeogenesis to produce glucose. If you'd like a refresher on this pathway, you can go watch the gluconeogenesis lecture. Now, glucose is exported to the blood and to the brain and other extrahepatic tissues. So then let's go to fatty acids. Fatty acids are also going to be mobilized and oxidized to acetyl CoA. Acetyl-CoA can't actually enter the citric acid cycle due to oxaloacetate levels being low because it's being diverted to gluconeogenesis, so then acetyl-CoA builds up. 
And the buildup of acetyl-CoA, excess acetyl-CoA, is what's used for ketone body formation. And the ketone bodies are going to be exported to the muscle and the brain, and this becomes our alternate energy source. Ketone body levels will increase, and if it goes over the capability of the kidneys to reabsorb ketones, they will end up in urine. So to summarize, within about two days of fasting, glucose levels will drop and ketone bodies will significantly rise as it becomes the body's alternate energy source. Fatty acids will be mobilized, but it can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it can't be used by the brain for energy. Okay, so that is what happens during a fasting and prolonged state of starvation. So now let's move on to the next hormone, and that is epinephrine. Let's discuss the physiological and metabolic effects of epinephrine. So epinephrine is secreted from the adrenal medulla when we're faced with a stressful situation. This is known as a fight or flight response. So for example, you know, you're walking into the room and there's a tiger ready to bite your head off. This is going to stimulate the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine to prepare the body for action or increased work. So epinephrine acts on muscles, liver, and adipose tissues. Epinephrine is going to increase your heart rate and blood pressure, so dilating your respiratory passages so you can increase oxygen intake and delivery to muscles. So in muscle, it's going to increase glycolysis activity by increasing the synthesis of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is an allosteric activator of phosphorfructor kinase 1, or PFK1. So you can produce more ATP or energy to support your muscles. So you can fight off the tiger that's in your room. It's also going to activate liver glycogen breakdown by activating glycogen phosphorylase. And so it's going to inhibit glycogen synthase so that it can convert glycogen to blood glucose, increasing glucose for energy. It's also going to stimulate the anaerobic degradation of glycogen in muscle by lactic acid fermentation so that we can produce ATP. So glycogen synthesis slows down and it's inhibited and gluconeogenesis activity is going to be activated so we can produce more glucose for energy. And it doesn't stop there. The body requires more energy. So epinephrine is also going to release fatty acids from adipose tissues. So similar to the action of glucagon, it's going to activate hormone-sensitive lipase. So we're going to mobilize fatty acids and release it to produce more ATP. Okay, because we're trying to fight off a tiger here. And another effect of epinephrine is it's going to also increase glucagon secretion and decrease insulin release. So to summarize, Epinephrine is going to be activating all of the pathways that produce glucose, that produce ATP, because we have increased work. We are in a fight or flight situation, and it's going to decrease all of the pathways and processes that store. So that is the hormonal regulation of metabolism. In this lecture, we learned how the hormones insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine regulate metabolic processes in the body and how they are involved in different metabolic states. After meals, fasted states, and during starvation. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow it down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire metabolism playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!